Connecting with my friends, love it. Connecting with some sketchy guy that needs remote access to my computer, really? We hear you. That's why AARP created the Fraud Watch Network. If you don't think this is right for me when you think AARP, then you don't know our... Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, those of you that are still dining in place, continue and enjoy your lunch. And uh, we know that there are people, as I said a moment ago, who are still outside in a, a line waiting for lunch, and we'll uh, let them join us as they do that. Uh, but we'd like to go ahead and get started. And I'm going to do that by introducing uh, our panelists. Each of them will speak for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then we have left enough time for about 20 minutes or so of questions on the back end. So feel free and we'll have a microphone available to you to ask the questions. And when we get to that point, if you'll just address your question to the appropriate panelist, uh, we'll let them respond to it. We have three panelists. You only see two uh, because transportation became an issue for the third panelist who tells me that he is uh, backlogged a little bit at an airport somewhere, but we expect him to be here in time to be the third speaker. So we're told he's relatively close and will be here. Uh, which brings up the issue of passenger rail, um, which is not on your panel, but is uh, something I'm very passionate about and don't lose an opportunity to talk about it when I can, and particularly when the Secretary of Transportation is in the room. Uh, Secretary uh, Wilson, welcome. Uh, just uh, by show of hands, if there was an efficient train that would leave Baton Rouge and take you to New Orleans in about an hour, raise your hand if you'd be in favor of that. Not, not in exchange for a new bridge and all the other things Baton Rouge needs. I, I get that. So. Uh, the enthusiasm still is there. So today is about transportation of the future, and that's certainly something that we hope we will see here. But how will we move in the future? And we have three very unique and talented people who will tell us their story about new modes of transportation that we want to share with you. The first speaker this afternoon is Lindsay West, the executive director of Baton Rouge Bike Share. Lindsay is the CEO of Bantam Strategy Group, founded and operated the first electric pedal assist bike sharing system in the Western Hemisphere and the fifth such system in the world. Zip Bike Share was based in Birmingham, Alabama. She has more than 12 years of operations experience in public transportation and healthcare. She was instrumental in transportation and air quality programs while serving as the deputy director of operations at the Regional Planning Commission of Greater Birmingham for six years. The back story on Lindsay is that a number of us who have been working on bike share took a trip to Birmingham and we were so impressed with the operation we said why don't we hire Lindsay? And she agreed to come to Baton Rouge and start the Baton Rouge bike share program. It was an extraordinary visit in Birmingham. We were quite impressed, and people like myself, who at times probably aren't in as good a shape as we would like to be, found it a wonderful experience to find that there are electric-assisted bikes. So when you kind of pedal and it gets a little tiring, this little motor that no one sees kind of helps you. And so those of you who would like to have bike share but think maybe on a hot summer day or going up and down a hill might be a little more than you could do, there's good news for people like me and you, and she'll tell you all about that. Our second speaker is Stephen Smith, the sales director for East Ride Cell. He is the director of sales at Ride Cell and brings more than 27 years of Silicon Valley tech sales and business development experience. He has built and managed teams evangelizing new technologies across both the consumer and enterprise marketplace. He's been contributor and manager on teams that introduced the Apple Macintosh, Apple Laser Writers, wireless data devices with Novatel Wireless, in-car GPS navigation systems with Magellan, and navigation and advertising sales solutions for mobile services with Navtech Nokia. He has a proven track record of building and leveraging partnerships internally 
and externally to generate significant revenue opportunities. The third, if you will, I'll go ahead and introduce our third panelist, uh, who is Randall Creighton. He's the Program and Development Director for Shared Use Mobility Center. Creighton leads the work with cities to develop pilot programs, funding, and policy environments for, for shared use mobility so that programs can work better for everyone. As the former executive director and co-founder of Buffalo Car Share, Creighton helped to grow the program from an idea in a startup competition at the University of Buffalo to a successful nonprofit organization providing car and bike sharing services to over 1,000 members. And hopefully, uh, Randall will be here shortly. Would you please join me in welcoming our panelists? Uh, they will address uh, you and make their presentations here from the podium. So, Lindsay, please, if you would, we'll get started. Good afternoon. Um, due to John Spain and several other stakeholders, some in this room and some not, I am now a proud resident of Baton Rouge. So I'm happy to be here today and to talk to you about the Baton Rouge Bike Share Program and where we're at and next steps and things that you'll see rolling out over the next 12 months and so on once we launch. So it's, very, it's gonna be very exciting. So we are moving forward. And I wanna to talk to you and make sure that everyone in this room understands what bike share is. So bike share is a self-automated uh, bike sharing system. So it's made up of these bikes here, kiosks, payment stations, and um, these are, it's a dense network of these stations all over the city. I will show you a map in just a little bit about what we're thinking about for um, Baton Rouge. But a, the density of this system is actually very important for use and for mobility. And so that's a very important piece that I'd like you to take from this slide. Um, but it is more than just the bikes. As you can see, this is basically rolling technology all around the community. It's truly a transportation option that we're introducing to complement other modes of transportation in Baton Rouge. Um, so I want to, I'm talking to you about bike share, but I'm really talking to you about livability. So, um, it's a membership-based system, and it is best for short one-way trips. Um, just to go from point A to point B, do what you need to do in your meeting, grab a coffee, go to whatever destination you're trying to get to, dock the bike, and you don't have to worry about that bike any longer until you want to come back out and grab another bike and go back to your original destination or on to your next one. You do not have to bring the bike back to the original dock that you had it from. So it's membership based, as I mentioned. So the prices are about $75 for a one year annual membership um, and then $6 for a day pass. Uh, we'll probably introduce some other um, pricing structures as well, but these are the basics and we have created a business and implementation plan with Tool Design Group, which outlines this. So um, you can see it's a very affordable form of transportation, and um, it's really an exciting thing. It's gonna be probably one of the most impactful transportation projects that Baton Rouge has seen in a while. Um, the first 30 to 45 minutes of every ride is actually included in that membership fee, and additional fees apply, apply if you keep the bike longer than a 30 or 45 minute window. Um, it will most likely be 45 minutes in Baton Rouge, but it, it varies across the country with various programs. And you get endless 45 minute rides during that time, during that day or that annual membership. Um, and you only accrue overtime fees if you keep that bike longer at a single time. This is to prevent people from taking the bike into a hotel or their office or their loft, and then it not truly being bike share and they're not being, uh, bikes are not then available for you or, you or I when we leave our meeting. So the user fees are something that's implemented kind of as a safeguard for everyone to share the system, and that's why they're there. Um, but we'll roll this out in a very comprehensive way where it's very clear and the message is very clear on all the kiosks and the website and it's not, there aren't any hidden user fees for someone. Um, mostly tourists are the ones that decide to keep the bike a little bit longer than, um, than residential individuals because they tend to know the system and to be annual members. So why people are choosing bike share and why this is kind of sweeping the nation with more than 100 cities um, that have already implemented bike share, and I'm telling you, I see it daily. There are more and more coming online. 
Um, economic competitiveness is absolutely a piece of this. 54% 54, 54 of millennials were surveyed for the American Transportation Survey and said they would consider moving to another city that provided more transportation options. So we're not ignoring stats like this, and we certainly are serving the community where we can recruit and retain the workforce and the skilled employees that we really want to see in Baton Rouge. And um, again, that's why many of these other communities have, done, have implemented bike share. Um, 150,000 more dollars was actually um, identified by Nice Ride Minnesota's system for small businesses and restaurants that had bike share kiosks closer to the, close to them. So that definitely shows that bike share can feed the small business. It's just an easier way to access some of the amenities that we love and the other investments that we have in the Baton Rouge community. And this is not a phenomenon in Minnesota. Uh, this has been seen in Portland and Miami and multiple other communities where um, the economic competitiveness piece has absolutely shown as a benefit for bike share. Obviously, the entertainment and residential sector growth that we're seeing in Baton Rouge is amazing. Over $123 million since 2010 has been spent in the downtown area. More residential is coming. You have multiple hotels that are opening up and a watermark just opened up and then courtyard just did the ribbon cutting you have 72 river boats that came in in 2015 I, I believe that it's projected for there to be even more river boats in um in, in next year in 2017 i'm trying to remember what year i am in and over a thousand events so this is letting me know bike share and baton rouge are ready to meet each other and then the transportation and connectivity piece of bike share and what it offers. It's a great first and last mile solution for individuals, especially those that are transit dependent. This certainly does not replace CATS in any way. It complements CATS. Um, Bill DeVille and I have sat down and he's a big supporter of bike share and understands that connectivity piece that we're offering between CATS and bike share and some of the other ride share modes that are being introduced. So um, I think this is a great a great marriage and um, can certainly be that first or last mile for someone um, that's using another mode of transportation to get into our downtown area or LSU or um, Southern University, wherever we've launched the bike share program. So they might drive their car in, take the bus in, and then use bike share for the rest of the connector. Obviously, it's a health and wellness. There are benefits for health and wellness. I think that goes without saying, but certainly 30 minutes on a bike can fight, um, can help reduce several chronic diseases. And um, I know an unsavory stat just came out from the Gallup survey that Baton Rouge is the most obese city in the United States and Louisiana is the most obese state. So with stats like that, we certainly need to implement health programs and those that are related around transportation are a great way to marry the two. Health and transportation just go hand in hand, especially with health care costs and transportation costs taking up a large portion of the funds that we take home. And that certainly affects the economy and the way people are then able to spend their money at these other businesses and for their personal needs. We certainly can track data as well from the bike share system. So how many miles were ridden, how many calories reduced, how many vehicle miles um, were reduced to vehicle emissions as well. And so we'll be tracking all of that system from the system. Bike Share gets an immense amount of data, and we will certainly use that data to inform other stakeholders in the community. So health departments can go after additional grants, or hospitals can use this, this data to go after additional grants to bring more funding into our, to our community for healthcare related initiatives and other, uh, other transportation related initiatives as well. Um, so this, this data can also be given to the Planning Commission and to the City Parish for um, additional bike infrastructure. Where, should, where are people riding? Where should we put this infrastructure? Now we'll have the data from live GPS on these bikes of where people are riding, where they feel safe, and that data can inform better decision making on the policy and political levels. So these are different bike share systems from around the country. So I want to make sure that you all know that they all look a little different. Sometimes the colors vary depending on sponsors that are involved and um, the vendor that's selected. There's certainly more technology coming out from the electric pedal assist that John mentioned earlier, which Birmingham was the first to do that. Baltimore just launched their electric pedal assist bike share program last week, actually. So they were the second. And Seattle has also um, committed to relaunching their bike share program and it being electric pedal assist. So it's definitely a movement that's happening across the country. It does not pedal for you. It is pedal powered. So um, you still have to pedal, put your own energy you, and burn your own 
calories, but it certainly does help you. And on a hot, muggy day or even a small incline, that assistance is very nice and really reduces the barriers for access for elderly individuals or individuals that possibly are obese or recovering from knee surgery that haven't been on a bike in 20 years. It's definitely that additional comfort level. And that's some, those are some of the reasons that we picked the electric pedal assist in Birmingham. Um, and this is the Birmingham system. And um, there are 100 electric pedal assist bikes out of 400. Also, you have a smart bike. This is Social Bike, and they are actually um, won the New Orleans bid. And so uh, they will, you will see these bikes rolling out in New Orleans in 2017 as well. And they have a smart bike system. Um, so it's, it, it's really interesting where the technology lives on the bike. So the commitment for Bike Chair really to Baton Rouge is that we're connecting people regardless of socioeconomic status to places and communities in Baton Rouge with a high performing, accessible and sustainable transportation al alternative that promotes health and economic vitality. I show you this because I want you to know this is the early commitment from Bike Share, and this is what you're going to see from the Baton Rouge Bike Share system. And so I'm making this statement very public. I think it's a lot to live up to, but I know uh, I've seen it done in multiple communities, and I know we can reach that here in Baton Rouge. And then the demographics of Bike Share, what we've seen across the country, and um, these are actually some stats that have come out of Birmingham as well, as our early adopters typically are Caucasian males ages 25 to 34. The secondary age group tends to be 35 to 44. There's about a 1% difference, so I think it's very important to include the two different age groups. And they're educated and they're employed, and that's wonderful, and that's really where some of our sales and marketing um, focuses, but we certainly cannot ignore the equity piece of bike share that is also sweeping the country. And Baton Rouge Bike Share is committed to having a community engagement coordinator that's solely focused on bike safety and bike equity. When I talk about bike equity, I'm talking about women riding, people of color, low-income individuals, and seniors. So we want to make sure that bike share is, accept, uh, is accessible to multiple groups of people. That goes through um, station placement, but it's also through our outreach and education efforts and making sure that people understand what bike share is. And when bike share appears in their neighborhood, they don't look at it and say, this isn't really for me. We want everyone to understand that bike share is for them and how in the various ways they can use it for recreation or running errands or, or actually getting to work. So we'll have our, um, you will see several efforts and we have our hands full. And I'll talk about the low income piece in, um, in this next slide. So the Access for All program is for low income individuals where we provide uh, an annual membership at a subsidy rate. Um, so they can access the system and that financial barrier is not something that they're having to face and they're not having to choose between bike share or potentially some other um, necessity in their life. So even if they do not have access to a credit card, we'll accept cash payment, they will get an annual membership, and there's nothing that makes them look different from you or I that's riding these bikes. Um, their membership key fob looks the exact same. The only thing that um, makes them different is in our back office with our staff, and then we know um, that they're a low-income individual and that they paid in cash, et cetera, that some of these other things were opened up to them. So we don't want credit card to be a barrier, and we don't want the funding to be a barrier for someone to access the system. So we'll have um, that program, as well as various campaigns, maybe um, Heels and Wheels for Women to get women riding bicycles, um, and various campaigns throughout the year, bike safety courses potentially in partnership with AARP. These are some of the tactics I've seen across the country where it's a bike safety course specifically for seniors. So there are definitely elements to this outreach where we're very grassroots and um, we are out there on the street level with the community riding these bikes as well and, and, and getting people excited about them. Um, there certainly is a huge education and safety component to bike share. So um, the safety record for bike share across the country is, um, is phenomenal. It's about one in 50,000 rides where you might expect an injury where it's on bike share, where it's uh, one in 25,000 rides on your regular bike. Um, furthermore, there have been multiple studies just saying the cre cre increasing the demand in people riding bikes, the, just the riding by numbers is also um, something that can help with bike safety initiatives. And then bike share is a catalyst for more bike infrastructure in a community. We've seen it over and over again. Um, Boston had a half of a mile of a bike lane in their downtown area, and now they have close to 100 miles of bike lanes. 
um, once they launched the Hubway system. Chattanooga, Tennessee also saw very similar results where they had a couple of sharrows around their community. And now um, in 2015, they actually secured some CMAC funding, that's congestion mitigation, air quality federal dollars for some more bike infrastructure. And they are seeing protected bike lanes. So again, we have that data that informs good decision making. And then we have this program that creates the demand. Um, it's a chicken or egg discussion. Do you have bike share or bike infrastructure first? And what we found is having bike share creates the demand that then allows for that more bike infrastructure to come. But if you wait for bike infrastructure, then you might not have either. Uh, yet there are some amazing efforts going on in Baton Rouge right now with mixed use trails, I love seeing that. Uh, those will certainly be taken into consideration when we're launching stations and placing stations around places where people, we know people feel safe and have an avenue to not necessarily ride on the street. Even though every lane is a bike lane, so remember that when you're behind a cyclist, please give them three feet and remember they are allowed to be there. Um, helmets are not provided with bike share. Um, there's only one city in the United States that provides, by, uh, I'm sorry, requires bike helmets, and that's Seattle. We'll certainly have a, a helmet campaign and we'll encourage, um, encourage the use of helmets, um, but we will not have helmet vending machines or anything of that nature. Um, you're not required to wear a helmet if you're over the age of 12 in Louisiana. It's different in each state. Um, and so helmets are not, we found that hel helmets or having a helmet uh, available to you can be a barrier to access bike share. And for low-income individuals, it becomes an additional financial barrier. So um, the use of helmets is encouraged. We will work for the, uh, again, a helmet campaign where we try to give away free helmets and uh, things of that nature, but they're not typically required with bike share programs. And we we'll actually encourage it to not be a requirement and let individuals choose. Um, and then bike safety courses. We'll be offering free bike safety courses to adults all around Baton Rouge. So again, education, outreach, bike safety, partnering with um, various groups like Bike Baton Rouge and others that are doing some of these advocacy and safety efforts already. We'll certainly um, partner with them and make sure that we're all one unified voice and all working towards the same goal, which is a safer biking Baton Rouge. And then theft and vandalism is very low with bike share across the country, but in, in um, specifically, a lot of bike share vendors have been implementing live GPS, so I can see where the bikes are at all times, not only for that data piece, but for safety and security. And I call those educational opportunities, when you might have to go to someone's home and get the bike and explain to them how the system's used. But I'll tell you that we've had to do that a couple times in Birmingham, but everyone um, there was, you know, really, oh, I didn't understand. I, they had not read fully the, um, the system, so we call them educational opportunities. We're able to get every bike back. We've not lost a bike, and it's very, very rare for a bike to be completely lost in a bike share system. Um, and then liability falls on the operator and the, uh, of the bike share. It doesn't fall on the city. It doesn't fall on the sponsors that are involved. And then obviously everyone signs a waiver, whether it's a 24-hour membership, they sign that at the kiosk, or they're an annual membership. When they sign up online, they sign a waiver form. Um, so. Bike share and where we're at in Baton Rouge is, again, we did this uh, business and implementation plan with Tool Design Group. It's a really, really well-known transportation planning um, consulting firm that really focuses on um, active transportation and bike share is one of their expertise. And so that's by, uh, that will be launched in the next couple of weeks as well as a project page. And then um, we hope to launch in 2017. That is absolutely the goal. It's nonprofit owned with Baton Rouge Bike Share being a 501c3, as John mentioned before. And it's locally operated, hence that's where I come in and being a proud resident of Baton Rouge. And we'll have uh, eight full-time staff members um, focusing on all that education and safety and sales and marketing, customer service and fleet management that I was um, speaking about. We'll make sure that all the bikes are kept in pristine condition, chains are um, chained, chains are chained, uh, bikes are fixed, uh, and, and things as they are exposed to the elements 365 days a year, 24-7. The system never sleeps. And we'll have an office space for our equity clients to come in to access their memberships with cash, et cetera. And we have a fleet rebalancer, and that's where we make sure that the system is balanced appropriately for events and for various just movements of the city to make sure you don't come out and there's not a bike available for you. It's very rare. Um, the phasing is 51 stations, 500 bikes in phase one. It's the downtown LSU and um, Southern University 
are our first three phases, which you see in blue. The black dots are not necessarily representing exactly where the station will go. Um, it's more so showing you the density of the stations. And then we'll move on to mid-city and then to the health district and future phasing. So we'll be covering a large portion of the city and again that density and that dense network of stations to make it convenient and easy for people. Um, where we're at right now is we're in the fundraising um, portion of this project. I'm talking with corporate sponsors, with the city, with the MPO, with various stakeholders around the community and trying to get um, that funding in place. A lot of support coming from Baton Rouge and so that's very exciting. And then we'll soon release an RFP for the bike share equipment for the procurement of that equipment. And then there's the site planning and the permitting with the city. Where do the stations actually go? What corner? Where's their ADA compliance? Where's the right of way appropriate, etc. Then the branding and marketing will have a cool brand that comes out from this and um, everyone will be sporting water bottles and sunglasses and all that fun stuff that gets the word out. Um, and then operations piece, that's when the rest of the staff will be hired and trained. And then deployment, when you start seeing the stations um, on the street corners and that's when the social media buzz typically happens um, and there's really tangible evidence of bike share. And then the launch is really an exciting day where we do a big bike ride through the downtown area led by our wonderful stakeholders, a press conference, and the system goes live that day and we switch from um, deployment and launch to operations and then it's accessible to everyone. So it's a really, really exciting day. I'm actually getting chills talking about it because I've been through a bike share launch before and it's a lot of work, but it's so impactful. Um, just my words aren't, can't even express what that's gonna be in the Baton Rouge community. And then, again, what I was saying, just more short term, we'll be releasing that implementation and business plan for you all to comb through and really review. Um, it will be on the Baton Rouge Bike Share website. It's a project page that will be found on the BRAF website at first, and then we'll move to our own website once we start, um, once we have our brand and start selling memberships. And then the Facebook page. Follow us on Facebook. We are active right now, and that's where you can get the latest updates. So thank you for having me, and I appreciate all of your time, and I'd love to entertain your questions after the rest of our presenters are done. Thank you. Twenty seventeen, uh, sometime around July, August. Uh, I think we're going to shoot for this, so it's not that far off. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. She'll be available for uh, questions, as we said in just a moment. Randall, you made it. I've introduced you, but we can give you a round of applause. We've changed the order, so you're number three because we didn't know when you would get here, and we're delighted that you made it. And how ironic that we're talking about transportation. Uh, Stephen, if you would, please. <clears throat> Lindsay, that um, is amazingly impressive what you've accomplished. I, you know, some of us know what goes on under the hood and some of us don't, so um, congratulations. I want to thank CPAX and thank John and, and you all for attending this session um, to allow me to share with you some of the dynamic and exciting things that we're doing at RideSell in the area of public transportation in the country and in Australia and in Europe as well, actually. But um, those are not necessarily words that I would have strung together before starting at RideSo, exciting public transportation, but um, it has been a transformative couple years. Um, it's been a disruptive couple years with a number of different uh, flavors of, of transportation being introduced into the country, car sharing, ride sharing, bike sharing, Canoe sharing, I'm waiting for that one, but there's, <clears throat> in, in, in addition to changing fixed route transportation to on-demand to complement areas and times of need when um, ridership is low or doing the converse. So um, there's a lot of excitement in terms of investment, in terms of innovation, in terms of disruption in the space. And um, I want to just walk through with you briefly uh, some of the areas that uh, we're working with to make that happen, facilitate those changes, um, and then, you know, at the end, take any questions you might have. <clears throat> so RideCell addresses two needs, um, we feel, in the area of public transportation. One is uh, to consolidate the number of different options riders have to access transportation. Those include fixed route, those include on-demand, 
Those include on demand where I use my application to hail a vehicle, a phone, or an app. Uh, it could be ride sharing. We're seeing that growing. Uh, that would be an example of Uber and Lyft, the ride sharing space. Uh, car sharing, uh, examples like Reach Now and Car to Go, where I walk out in the street of Seattle and I pick up a car, BMW, could be a 300 and they have 700 series in the fleet, so that's kind of fun. And I take it anywhere I want in the city of Seattle, I park it on the street and walk away from it. It's the end of the story. That's where this uh, car sharing has evolved to. And then carpooling, where I may have the option to pick people up as I'm moving across town in Seattle in my car shared car. That's on the front end, that's the user experience. On the back end, from an administrative perspective, we provide analytics that help process and optimize all of these different modes of transportation to be able to make recommendations to the transit managers of different types of transit that they may want to implement in a given area or on a given route. <clears throat> We've done this over the last six years uh, for a number of different customers and flavors of customers. We have corporate campuses like Google's and Facebook where we manage uh, their on-demand routes. We have car-sharing cars spread around campuses. Uh, we have uh, ride-sharing implemented on those campuses. And we do this as well on university campuses. They, they mirror each other pretty much, except hmm, the corporate guys have a little more money than the, the schools do to implement. And uh, we are also doing these for, for a couple different public transit agencies, um, such as Southwest and in the Silicon Valley area as well. The challenge starts with the cost to maintain a fixed route bus, and we believe that that's between $120 a driver hour to $150. And oftentimes those fixed routes are not being maximized in terms of ridership. <clears throat> if you could implement a more of a on-demand or a flex type route um, with uh, less expensive equipment, uh, you would reduce costs, and with our application, we've seen, we've driven ridership up significantly because of the easy access to the network, to the system, to the rides. It's a classic example. I'm sure any of you who are in transportation will see, okay, no brainer. In the morning, everyone's on the bus. At the end of the day, everyone's on the bus, and in between, peaks and valleys. Yet the cost of the bus and the driver stays the same. Our system will go in and look at that process, look at that route, and make specific recommendations in terms of, well, at certain times of the day, if you were to put in a smaller van with a driver for a couple hours in the morning and the afternoon, you'd reduce your costs, you'd reduce your ETAs, uh, you'd reduce your wait times for your riders. Conversely, in other areas, our system may say, you know what, you're on demand, your vans are at capacity all day long, you need to put in fixed routes. And here would be the metrics that would support that. And that's the type of thing our system will do on the back end, providing visibility to managers that manage these systems to say, okay, it helps make my job a little easier. With Southwest Transit, um, we were implementing this system a couple years ago, and this is a, this is a graph of where we have a consistent number of drivers across those number of months, and this was a, from implementation to starting to see results. There was 45-day period, 30-day period where we were really impacting to this degree, where the drivers and the, and the equipment were pretty consistent, yet the passengers the ridership spiked and significantly went up all the way across the period uh, with this is a snapshot of. And these are the, more the, the hard statistics of what we were seeing when we implemented that program in terms of 820% increase of rider requests. Now, understand the difference. Now they had an application, or they could go to a website. Or the system allows them to call in as well, because not everyone has access to the internet or a mobile smart device. But a lot of people do, and the easy access to the system spiked the ridership requests and spiked the use of the system 
by 773% and decreased wait times by 28%. I mean, these are just, these are crazy numbers. And Southwest has decided to expand the service across beyond Eden Prairie into other areas of, of their responsibility. <clears throat> and how the system works is pretty simply, um, I have this problem with my home remote too. I get to master it. The user makes a request, as I said, app, web, or phone call. Uh, the system real time matches that rider, the driver, where the rider wants to go and where the driver is. So it takes that all into consideration and then sets up a pickup and it uses Google Maps uh, and Google traffic. So it's factoring traffic into the ETA and the delivery time for that passenger. Uh, the user can get a notification via uh, real time about where that driver is and notification when the driver's showing up. And they get this notification either via text to their device uh, and that will, or, or on the app that shows the driver and the wait time. It's really important in Eden Prairie in the middle of winter pretty significant feature. Here's an example where we've consolidated the application. I'm not a technical guy. That's the problem. I'm a sales guy. We've allowed the, the application to kick out multiple options for the user. The user says, I want to go from point A to point B. The system says, OK, we all like choice. Here's your choice. You can take the light rail, light rail system, uh, and it would cost you this much, and it would take you this amount of time. Your other option is grab a bike. You can bike share over. It's going to cost you this, take this amount of time. You can get an on-demand pickup of a shuttle service, uh, or you can get a pickup of a car share service, ride share service. Pricing vary, costs vary, but on the other end of the system, the visibility to the user in terms of what they select and the path they'll take and what they can get there gets fed out and is, is displayed. In more detail, um, this provides the user driver update of, okay, let's just jump to BMW. That's more exciting anyway. So BMW invested into RideSell uh, uh, about a year or so ago, and the objective was to to implement a car share service. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Car2Go in the United States? Okay. It, they're not all over. You go to Europe, I mean, there's a ton of those type of services all over. Uh, but Car2Go is the most famous in, in the States so far. Uh, we launched with BMW in the city of Seattle, and within a very short period of time, we reached, they reached 30,000 customers slash users slash members. They launched with 370 cars. As I said, their fleet included i3s, 300 series, 700 series, and they've expanded that to 570 cars due to the success of the program. They moved to Portland two months ago and will expand to nine other cities throughout the rest of the year. And the key to them being able to implement this system is full autonomous dispatch and management of the cars and the drivers of the cars and the members. The way we validate a driver is the driver takes a picture of themselves, they take a picture of their license, we do a license check, and with a credit card, they're able to grab a car anywhere throughout the city of Seattle. It's probably familiar to any of you who have used a car sharing service, gives you your price, uh, shows your car so you know what it looks like, the license plate, and if you have any issues with the car, unlocking it, uh, or its cleanliness, or its uh, gas, or level of electricity, you can report that back to the system. And this would just be a snapshot of the administrator's view of where the cars are throughout the city of Seattle. Now, Lindsay touched on the challenge of load balancing of those cars. With bikes, you actually, well, you could actually do something like what we're doing with BMW, is we're incenting users or members to move the cars where we would like them to be. So if in a given day they all end up down by the wharf in Seattle, 
we can say to users, while you're driving the car, <clears throat> we know you want to take it over to the wharf, but if you take it three blocks east of that, we'll give you an hour of free drive time. Or it could be really extreme. On a Saturday, we need to get cars in a certain part of town. We can push a notification out to members that says, if you want to go out this afternoon and move a car or two, we'll give you X number of hours of free drive time. So at the first level, our members become our load balancing mechanism. So in a nutshell, um, just to sum it, some, some in summation of what ride sell and who ride sell is. The DNA or the heritage of the founders is they had founded a, a taxi cab service uh, that they managed through full automation of dispatch with four employees and 2,500 taxis throughout the Bay Area. So they have an in-house, we've got quite a bit of in expert design expertise in terms of advising our customers on what they need to be doing to maximize their transit systems. We're able to integrate the user experience and the back-end management experience into one system, leveraging the years of experience that are in the company, working with some of the largest universities, corporations, and public transit systems. We're able to power the business from end to end, uh, from a consumer, from a fleet management, supply the analytics to assist fleet management in making cost-effective decisions that are also good for the riders, good for the community, uh, good for the budget, and help with marketing as well as processing payments. So that's kind of ride so in a nutshell. It goes a lot deeper in a lot of other areas, but I really wanted to give you all a, a top-line view of what the service is and what we've accomplished. Thank you. I'm sure lots of questions when we get to that moment in the program. Uh, Baton Rouge applied to a smart city grant last year, and RideCell was one of the companies that the group talked to and actually had conversations about how that program might be integrated into our CATS transit system. So uh, it's something that actually we discovered would be very, very helpful to our community, and we look forward to having that relationship some, sometime down the road. Randall, please, if you'll join us, welcome to Baton Rouge. We're delighted you're here. Actually, uh, less time than I was expecting. As a, as a northerner, your highways are a little faster out here. So, um, so I, I'm going to give, so my name's Creighton. I'm with the Shared Use Mobility Center. Um, my, back, my background is actually not too different than, than Lindsay's. Uh, I was involved in uh, nonprofit car sharing and bike sharing uh, for the last two years. I've been with the Shared Use Mobility Center, which I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, we're a national public interest organization that uh, has the opportunity to, to both work with folks uh, from the nonprofit and public sectors as well as, as, as folks from the, the private sector that are doing really cool things too. Uh, so uh, we uh, were formed two years ago, as I said. Uh, we're Chicago-based. Uh, our mission is to uh, make it possible to live well without the need to own your own vehicle. And as I'm sure all you know, uh, there are a lot of interesting things happening right now that are making that um, much closer to a reality than even it was two years ago. How many folks have used Uber or Lyft in the room, just by a show of hands? Wow. Okay. And what about a car sharing program? Zipcar or car to go or drive now? And, and what about uh, bike sharing in another city? Okay. Great. That's helpful. So I'll give you some background on the industry, the range of uh, stuff out there, um, exciting things happening, uh, and also kind of drill down a little bit on some models that are more relevant for small to mid-sized cities. There's been a lot of um, uh, robust activity uh, among small to mid-sized cities, a lot of passion, um, and a, a lot of um, sort of bold moves. So I'll drill down on that a little bit if we have some time. So some see Shared Use Mobility Center. Uh, we uh, provide kind of a range of things, right? So we convene folks, uh, we bring people together at conferences and summits and workshops to talk about these things, the public, the private, the nonprofit sector. Um, and we have a, a, a research, in-house research team. So we um, have a best practices database and clearinghouse of information on the industry, uh, some mapping tools, which I'll, I'll kind of uh, breeze over. Uh, and we also work with cities as a technical consultant to um, 
I'm really a, more advisor in some ways than consultants because we sort of we have a, a, a public interest focus. So sometimes we sometimes we can be the noisiest ones in the room. But we we work with cities both on pilot projects and also um, on action plans. So um, I'll go a little bit over that as well. So this is our this is our website. I'd encourage everybody to go. Just if you want to get to know more about shared mobility, this is a great place to start. And I'm going to use the terms shared use mobility and shared mobility interchangeably here. Um, so you take a city like Pittsburgh, um, which a few years ago really uh, didn't have a lot in terms of, of, of shared mobility now is, is, as some of you may have heard, experimenting with driverless vehicles with Uber. Um, and you can just drill down on, on Pittsburgh and see where are the cars, where are the bikes, what systems are out there. Um, and if you want to explore a little bit deeper in policy areas, you can do that as well. Um, so good place to start. I'm going to give a high level overview. Uh, the, 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 the territory is really shifting here, as I'm sure this is at this point self-evident to a lot of folks, from I own my own transportation to I still own my own transportation. You know, you look, you look at Zipcar, the car sharing organization five years ago, and their, their, um, their thing was really, well, you know, you maybe don't need to own that second car because um, you have all these options, to now it, you know, being a real, realistic possibility that five years from now, um, in, in cities um, that, that uh, don't have as an extens ex extensive of a transit system as, let's say, New York City or Manhattan, uh, you could live very well without, without owning a car and, and really just accessing a suite of services, as Stephen mentioned, uh, to get around where you need to go. So what do we say when we say shared use mobility? What do we mean? You know, you can kind of boil it down into these nine categories. And Again, two years ago, half of these things weren't really on the, on the, the list. Um, car sharing started in the U.S. maybe 15 years ago. Bike sharing maybe about a decade ago. Um, but really, in the last few years, you've seen the advent of not only ride sourcing programs like Uber and Lyft, but also the sort of companies um, like, like RideSell that have grown very quickly to sort of f both fill in the gaps in service, but also kind of network these options, right? So uh, one thing that's really gotten a lot of traction and a lot of interest in the last year has been what we're, what we're calling private transit, what's been, um, if you Google the term, the term micro transit, that's really been the sort of the, the term that's been popularized over the last year. But services like the VTA program that, um, that Stephen mentioned in San Jose is one example, um, where the, the, the Southwest Transit he mentioned as, as well, companies like Bridge and Chariot. Um, and, you know, we're also seeing a trend uh, that sort of blends uh, ride splitting, uh, or you could even say ride sharing or carpooling. There's a lot of overlap in these terms now with Uber and Lyft. In cities like Chicago or uh, San Francisco or New York, most of the rides taken on Uber and Lyft are with two or maybe th even three, in some cases, strangers in uh, the car with you. There's even sort of a, a merger of those models with what Stephen mentioned. Uh, there's a service called Via in, in New York that um, uh, basically is like a, a van and you might have four or six other people with it and it sort of reroutes um, you know, as needed and, and you got a bunch of folks essentially riding a bus but uh, it's sort of a dynamically routed bus. So there's, a, there's, a, there's just a, a wide range of really interesting things happening in this space right now. And this is a, a map we do our best to track and categorize. Um, you can see there's a lot going on in this industry right now. So why do we need these things? Well, Stephen covered a lot of these points. But, you know, there's both the sort of the, the gaps, right, the, the peak times or non-peak times, I should say, that, that Stephen mentioned, um, where you do see uh, Uber and Lyft and services like this really coming to play. Um, late night service, weekend service. Same's true for car sharing. Um, car sharing is, tends to be a, a weekend thing. Um, but I, one of the things I want to really highlight is, is that we're seeing this very common among small and mid-sized cities. When you're trying to get something going, you're trying to sort of um, speed up and implement some things, and you're considering light rail, you're considering um, major public works projects. They often carry a very big price tag. These programs do not, right? So the relative cost of a, launching a bike share program is like, is like pennies compared to 
um, thinking about you know interchange reconstruction or, or or new transit systems. Even sort of converting a bus into a bus rapid transit system is is in the um, tens of if not sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but the, the flip side of that is you really need transit at sort of the core of these services. Um, none of this stuff works if you don't uh, have that main way to shed your car, and that most often comes from having reliable public transit. So a couple of trends I'm just going to highlight before we kind of drill down on, on stuff applicable for smaller cities. So in, in part because of um, funding opportunities, uh, driven largely by California, but um, with things like the Volkswagen settlement that some of you may have heard of, uh, you know, really opportunities are going to be abound in, in the electric vehicle area over the next several years. So that's something to watch out for, both in the bike share context, but also with car sharing. Um, Drive Now, is, as Stephen mentioned, is a, I think in all cities, an all electric program, right? Reach Now. Reach Now, sorry. So they're, 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 they're getting there in terms of their electric, uh, electric vehicles. You know, I'll, I'll say quasi-public transit to kind of encompass a lot of those models I was talking about earlier. Um, some really interesting startups around carpooling and, and, and ride splitting. Um, Uber and Lyft themselves are, are really innovating in these, in these areas. And um, an area that I think is seeing a lot of attention now and will continue to is uh, replacing, essentially replacing or augmenting paratransit service. So in a lot of uh, areas, there's really only one paratransit provider, and that's the, that's the transit agency. And it's a big part of the income of the transit agency. You also have other areas where you're reliant in large part on a taxi system or maybe a volunteer, uh, a, a basically a volunteer ride program. And so um, with sort of the layer of technology, there's a lot of new interesting things coming, coming online here. And I'll, I'll I'll touch on a few of those. Of course, you know, I can't have a PowerPoint slide without mentioning autonomous vehicles, right? Um, that's coming. It's coming quickly. Uh, I'm going to get to some of the partnerships with automakers. Those are largely driven, frankly, by the advent of autonomous vehicles. And as Stephen mentioned, there are a number of firms. Uh, right Cell looks like they're um, uh, leading the pack in some ways, uh, uh, doing what, what, was, what was mentioned, basically. I want a suite of options, and I want them all on my phone, uh, and I want to be able to price them and um, eventually even book all those trips in that one place without having to leave my app and go to the, the Uber app or go to the bike share app. So what are automakers doing? To us, this is a huge signal that things are changing, and they're changing quickly, and, and uh, it's a signal of this, the sort of scale of investment that's coming into this uh, arena from the private sector. GM uh, made a $500 million investment in Lyft earlier this year. They've launched their own ride-sharing service called Maven, which is now in, I want to say, about a dozen cities, um, just has launched within the last few months. Uh, you see um, Reach Now, which I need to change my slide. I still used to call on them, call on them Drive Now, which they were for several years. Reach Now from BMW and, and car go which is Daimler. Um, both, both basically investing directly in creating their own fleet of vehicles, using their own, using their own vehicles of, of usually one, um, one model. And more recently, Ford uh, and Toyota have made investments. So Toyota, this is like I think two days ago, maybe Friday or Saturday, uh, Toyota announced a major investment in GetAround. GetAround is a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing program, so I share my vehicle with you. Uh, there's tech installed in it. When I'm not using it, you can use it and I'll make a little bit of money off of it. And Ford has made several, um, you could say they sort of dabble a little bit in shared mobility. So they've sponsored a bike share program in San Francisco. They bought a, uh, a, a micro transit or private transit service called Chariot. So automakers are making big investments in this space. So one of the things we looked at over the last year was like, what's the point, right? Like, do these things actually make a big difference, right? These services are still, um, um, in some ways, a small part of people's lives if you look at them on their own. But the, the, the fact that you have these services there makes a big difference in people's lives, even if they use these services once a month or two or three times a year. So we recently did a, a, a report for, um, 
for the Transportation Research Board, basically for the federal government, called TCRP 188. If you want a more detailed look, you can go online. And in, in a nutshell, what we found was that if you have three or more of these services available, you're going to basically own a half a car less. So, you know, if you're living in an urban area, you've got access to car share, you've got access to bike share, you've got access to Uber, you're going to shed your automobile. That is going to reduce your driving, it's going to reduce congestion for everybody. Um, it's kind of common sense, but, you know, we need to take back and take a step back and study it. Um, so we, we coined this term su super shares. So if you only have a transit experience and you're living in an area that we studied, your household's going to own a car and a half. If you have access to three or more modes, uh, you're going you're gonna to have basically uh, less, than, less than a car per household. Um, so let's, let me just kind of bring it back a little bit to small and mid-sized cities. So what's relevant to Louisiana? Well, as I mentioned, I got my start um, working in nonprofit car and bike sharing in Buffalo, New York, a uh, city not too different from, from Baton Rouge um, or New Orleans. So I'm going to group what's going on with small to mid-sized cities into like three buckets, and I'm going to try to avoid as much as I can mentioning San Francisco because, you know, there's a lot of interesting things happening there. There's a lot of interesting, I, you know, you could also, I think, in some ways loop Seattle in with San Francisco, right? But there also are a lot of really interesting things happening with smaller cities, cities that are more auto-oriented. So one of the things that's a trend we're noticing in small and mid-sized cities is that public-private partnerships are really uh, happening in a way that is, uh, to me, uh, surprising and encouraging. And um, public agencies are making bolder moves than they did even a year ago. So a good example of this is Rochester, New York. Rochester is simultaneously going from just having transit service to layering on uh, a reverse commute van pool service to bring folks to suburban jobs that transit can't reach. They're adding a car share program. They're adding a bike share program. Rochester is saying, for example, on their bike share program, they, they recently um, awarded their contract. They said, we're not going to pay for it. We want somebody to come in and tell us who's going to sponsor the program. They're working with a, a service called, called Zagster that, that Lindsay might be looking at. And Zagster came in and, and said, you know, we think we can land this sponsor, whether it be a, a health system or a, or a major employer like Kodak, let's say. Um, and that'll pay for the system itself. Next door in Buffalo, my former colleagues have launched a system with social bicycles. Um, that is fully paid for by the health care system. And, you know, you go back a year or two years, small, mid-sized cities were getting these consulting studies done, like, like the one that Lindsay did with um, um, Allison, that uh, blanking on the firm's name. But, um, you know, the, 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 the consultants said, wait a little bit. They said actually the opposite of what Lindsay was saying. They said, wait until you have the bike infrastructure in place. And now you've got cities doing exactly as Lindsay set, said, like, being proactive about their infrastructure by saying, you know what, it's really relatively inexpensive to launch a bike share system. So that, you know, it's not just about bike share. Um, some, of the, some of the things that Stephen mentioned in terms of like small pilots you see happening not only with sort of first last mile, I want to get off of a train or a bus and connect direct to my workplace, um, but also um, services for the elderly and, and disabled. So Space Coast Area Transit is a good example. A lot of employers have bought into a, a program that provides um, van pool trips to work, and uh, the contractor, V-Ride, has, has augmented that with basically a fleet of vehicles for social service agencies. Um, you see some interesting things happen in Pinellas, Florida, uh, with uh, a first last mile partnership with Uber. Um, get around uh, the peer-to-peer -peer program I mentioned has pilots in Oakland and in Chicago, um, work, working with us on basically extending their model into communities, suburban communities that otherwise wouldn't have these services. Another theme, I'm just going to kind of rush through these, another theme uh, among small to mid-sized cities is nonprofit models. Um, you're not going to get the sort of speed of delivery at the cost of, um, that, that's affordable for, for a lot of smaller cities without looking at the nonprofit model. I'm, partial to this, of course, myself having been in, in the sector for a long time. But w w when you have someone like Lindsay who comes on stage and is passionate 
and is a champion for this kind of thing, that's what makes these things happen. When you have a, 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 a city like Baton Rouge or Buffalo where everything's one connection away, you need that singular champion, and that, that just most often happens through a nonprofit model. So you're seeing a lot of really interesting things happen. I'll give you another example, it's, it's Fresno, California. Fresno is never gonna be, particularly in the rural, rural parts of, of Fresno, the Central Valley of California, it's not gonna be a market for Uber, right? But you've got informal networks that have existed that are like Uber for a long time. Uh, they call it Green Ritero, well, they call it a Ritero's program. They're, they're sort of electrifying it now, but um, it's essentially, you know, a guy that sits in a coffee shop that's a retired farm worker, and you go up to him and you say, you know, I need to go, I need to go to Fresno, I need to go to Modesto for a court appointment or for a doctor's appointment. And the guy says, well, I'm taking your neighbor at 10 o'clock, and if you want to go with her, you know, it'll only cost you 15, 20 dollars, you know, sliding scale thing. So it's really kind of like, there are these informal networks that exist, and now with the sort of advent of technology, of electric vehicles, these things are kind of coming out of the woodwork in a sense. And, and nonprofit models, in, in many cases, are, are the way that that's going to be successful in smaller cities. Another example would be Wright Austin. Um, so the city of Austin, Texas, um, said Uber, Lyft, you have to do background checks on your drivers. Uber and Lyft left the city. Uh, there were thousands of drivers that had been providing the service, and they were basically missing an app. So you had a, a consortium of tech developers come in and say, well, let's just create a nonprofit and build the app, and we'll recruit those drivers, and it's working. It's, it's successful, it's um, being white-labeled, which for folks that aren't in the sort of tech sector, white-labeling white, white label, basically means they did something that worked well, and they want to sell it to um, folks like Lindsay so we can make it work in Baton Rouge. Um, another thing, I just want to touch on this last theme with non nonprofit. Or sorry, with small and mid-sized cities. Is like smaller cities are dreaming big. Um, you know, Baton Rouge applied for the um, Smart Cities program. The winner of that uh, that um, competition, which was awarded forty million dollars, one winner, um, five runners up, many of whom were small cities, was Columbus, Ohio. Columbus said, "We want to do a bunch of these, you know, s small sort of." Um, interventions, and they came up with like 15 of them. I don't know how they're gonna do it all, but they were awarded $40 million. You know, you got Columbus dreaming big. Indianapolis launched a, a, a system of electric car sharing similar to uh, the, the Reach Now service, but sort of tied to hubs like bike share systems are. Indianapolis never would have been a city that folks would have thought of as like le leading edge in terms of electric vehicle car sharing, but they're doing it and it's working. Chattanooga, you, some of you may have heard recently launched an electric car share program. Kansas City and San Jose, not, not cities that people think of first, are the ones that are on the leading edge of the programs that Stephen mentioned. Um, and you see more and more rounds of, of the federal government, this is, this is only going to uh, increase, I think like, likely, with, with where things are going at the federal level. Uh, in the future. So there's a thing called the Mobility on Demand Sandbox. A lot of small mid-sized cities are experimenting with this. Verm you know, state of Vermont is saying, what can we do around paratransit? Um, Dallas and Pinellas, Florida, as I mentioned, are saying, what can we do to kind of make this Uber partnership extend a little bit farther into serving the folks that need it most? So you have, you have cities that, you know, um, two years ago just weren't on the radar for shared mobility or shared use mobility, um, now really trying some interesting things. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, leadership in these cities, stepping up and saying, this is the future, we need to be a part of it, what's the bold thing we can do to, 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 um, to work on this stuff? So I just want to highlight a, 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 a few ways that this kind of can get um, expedited, right? So Los Angeles is a good example. Uh, this is the first city that we put a lot of effort into um, because auto-dominated uh, and uh, great transit system built out, but hadn't yet sort of driven the, 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 the individual change because it's still really tough to get around the city without a car, um, a lot of gaps in service. So we started doing a number of things. We held a conference, a regional conference, we started holding workshops. We put together a, 
an action plan that's partly about policy, it's partly about funding. Um, and again, I said those are our first one, right? We're sort of drilling that down a little bit because we realized that um, smaller cities, mid-sized cities are, are, are really um, in, in need of, of that sort of action plan a little bit more. There's, there's sort of a, a thirst to, to catch up as, as, um, as Lindsay described. So we're, we're starting to apply some of our tools, some of our mapping resources, our, 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 our database, our policy database to cities like Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, you know, and we'd, we'd, we'd love to uh, share our resources as much as we can. Most of them are freely available um, to, to cities like Baton Rouge that are trying more interesting things. But a lot of it comes down to like, you know, taking a look at what's realistic, right? So um, where are the areas just by demographics, just by density, where we can get some of this stuff going? Let's start with that. Um, and then let's have a, a, a relatively quick discussion about what we can do in five years. What are the pol quick policy wins? What are the things we think we can do in two or three years? Where's the funding gonna come from? Again, you know, whether it's federal transportation dollars, um, climate mitigation dollars, um, there are um, a lot of sources of funding coming down the pike and um, cities just need to sort of be prepared for them. So that's why we've sort of taken this approach of, of really uh, focusing on action plans. So I ran through a lot of stuff. Um, I know we got, we want to leave time for questions. So um, I'll, I'm sure you'll have some, so I'll take them at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Creighton. I apologize for reversing your name in my introduction. Uh, we're at an exciting time in Baton Rouge because we have the council now has approved Zipcar. Bike share will be coming next year. Planning is underway for a tram that will connect downtown to LSU. Planning is underway on an intercity train between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. If you look around downtown, we've installed, with the help of Energy and the city parish government, uh, electric charging stations at a number of locations to encourage people to look at alternative fuel source vehicles. So uh, a lot of planning is going on, a lot of work is going on. We're also at an interesting time in a transfer of leadership for our city. I wanted to recognize Senator Broom standing down here who is one of our mayoral candidates and should she be so lucky to be elected, she will have to continue some of these programs and expand on them, so we're delighted that you're here. I have a microphone here that we'll send down to the audience for those of you who would like to ask questions. We're going to extend this session for another five, ten minutes or as long as we can get many of the questions in. So. Uh, Rachel's going to take the mic and just ask your questions, and the panelists will respond. Raise your hand in the back. A couple of people in the back. Rachel or in front. We've got some of both. Hello. My question is for Lindsay. You talked about uh, bike sharing equity. And given how healthy habits are made at young ages, are you thinking about trying to incorporate smaller bikes for younger users out there? I've, I've never seen bike sharing have small bikes for small children. Um, and if so, what are the challenges that you're facing with getting those out there? So this question actually comes up a lot um, for bike share operators. And liability is absolutely an issue with bike share and children. And so that's why you don't see any um, kids' bikes in bike share systems in the U.S. I know that somebody, I believe it was in um, France, toyed with trikes for kids. Um, and um, you might could speak to where they took that. But for the U.S. specifically, it's a liability issue. So what we do is actually, again, partner with groups that are already providing that um, ed bike education for children. And we encourage the families to get out to the parks and take your kids' bikes, which are much smaller to transport, transport easier, and then get on one of our bike share bikes to ride with your kids and to get out there and explore the parks. Um, and so that's where, I mean, it's just a liability issue and, sometime, and to a degree from the technology of functionality issue. Um, smaller bikes, smaller, I mean, the docks are larger. So um, that's... I mean, those are some of the challenges with introducing a kid's bike into bike share and the way that we encourage still use with kids riding. Another question back here in the back, Rachel. Uh, 
Uh, my, my question was um, regarding the coordination with transit agencies themselves. Um, you know, I think it's really important, like you said, uh, the different ways, the last mile, um, the interconnectivity, the, and really the, you know, compatibility with these different systems, but really having the strength of a public transit system itself, um, how important that is so that you can complement the different modes. Um, what kind of coordination between the different agencies that you guys work with? Um, and then also, like looking forward of ways to fund, um, are there um, opportunities for dedicated revenue streams coming from some of these different services going back into the, the transit system? That hour-long program is going to take uh, you next door. Uh, you all want to do quick, and Stephen, you want to start? Yeah, from a technical standpoint, I mean, it's just um, it's a matter of opening up APIs from the uh, Transit Authority and providing that information to our system. And we do a whole, you know, after we've established that there's interest with a prospective client or customer, we do a whole uh, day, often or more, of a design uh, workshop uh, and that's technical both in terms of you know what has to happen to make uh, to achieve the goals and objectives of the agency so it, it gets technical way beyond my pay grade I guarantee you real fast but um, it, it, it does happen it's what we're doing Southwest Transit we're able to share that information Great, and you want to respond so yeah I, I'm gonna just generalize a little bit here for sake of time uh, big cities are definitely looking very closely at their role whether it be uh, a convener or a facilitator, um, coordinator. Some, sometimes the, the term um, regulator gets, gets sort of whispered to your point about you know, rev revenue sources, um, but I haven't heard that publicly aired yet. Um, you do see opportunities with bigger cities for um, consolidation of, of, of roles, right? So like the Los Angeles Department of Transportation is uh, coordinating the car share program we're working with them on. They also run the transit authority and they run streets, right? Smaller cities, mid-sized cities as well, are, as I was mentioning, they're, they're being a little bit more bold with their role. So, like, I'll, I'll talk about the, you know, Capital District in, in, New, in New York, upstate New York. And they're directly saying, do we want to run our own bike share? Do we want to run or have a couple of board seats on the nonprofit car share? Uh, do we want to run our own sort of adaptive van pool program? So um, all across the board, you see transit agencies stepping up into a leadership role, but smaller cities are more likely to say, let's take this stuff hands on. So as a result of the smart city application that the city applied for last year but did not get, the council has now appointed two separate smart city committees to continue the conversations and planning for how we might do this in Baton Rouge. Uh, we are out of time. Thank you for staying with us and for your attention. Would you give our panel one more round of applause and thank them for being here.